Hi, Misha here, and we've done on quite a few more modern guns recently, at least relatively modern, and I want to do a Milserp. And I really want to talk about example pieces and collections, collecting, kind of uh, upgrading, ways of doing things where if you find something that's good enough, well, you can take it for now and then find a better one later and actually maybe even profit by it and help yourself out in the long run. You don't have to just hold out for the exact right perfect example all the time, unless you want to. But sometimes it's acceptable to go good enough and then, you know, upgrade later. Now, I'm no expert on the Springfield Model 1903. It's a nice rifle. I've owned one for a long time, but I have a passing interest. And these are mine that you've seen in various videos and they're fine for me up on the top we have a World War One O three 03 that was rebuilt during World War II per the barrel stamp and on the bottom we have my Remington 03A3 that I actually originally purchased a very long time ago and does have some sentimental value to me it's a good example and in the middle this is an example piece of something I wanted. I had fired a friend's growing up, which he got from his father. It was a 1903 Mark I. And I had a chance to pick this one up some years back. And so I did. It's fine. It's an example piece. It was rebuilt in World War II. In fact, it's got a 1944 barrel date. It's obviously in the later C-type stock, also making it a 1903A1. And it doesn't have the original cutoff and all that, but that's fine. It had the Mark I ejection port and the markings, and it was an example piece. It suited me well for a number of years. I didn't even mind. It's kind of somewhat ratty condition. It just means it was been there done that but recently I had a chance to upgrade this came from a friend and quite advanced collector when it comes to things like O3s and whatnot and it's a pretty solid example of a 1903 mark 1 and while it too is not perfect it's considerably better and so it's time to upgrade. And my plan is to move this one along. And I will be able to get more out of it than what I put in it because I picked it up for a good deal. And while it won't cover the complete cost of this, it will help. For example, and these aren't necessarily the real dollars, but you know, just to say, this one he wanted a thousand bucks for. And if I paid him a thousand bucks, great. But this one I picked up for say four hundred dollars. And if I sell it for six, then instead of paying a full thousand dollars, I'm paying eight hundred. And in the interim, for the last few years, I've had at least an example piece of a Mark One to show you, and one I wouldn't mind shooting because of the World War II barrel. That's what's helped me, especially with Milser, but it can be applied to anything over the years. It's always good to step up. On the other hand, I've never wanted 99%, 100% guns. For one, my luck, I'll immediately drop it and scratch it or crack a stock. For another, they're too nice to shoot. In fact, I had a Remington made Berthier 1907-15 that was like that. It was just too pretty. I had to sell it. No, I'm more comfortable in the, say, 85 to 90, maybe 95% range. That way if I put a dinger dong on the stock, oh well, there's already a couple at least. It's not ratted out and ugly. But um, yeah, a few other things I don't like. I don't like sanded stocks. That drives me crazy. Once in a blue moon, I'll accept, accept some light sanding. What I really can't accept are reblues, unless the refinishing was done by a military arsenal. That That's okay. But if it's done by, you know, Bubba Gunsmith in 1952, uh, no thanks. This is just into collecting. 
So yeah, with this here and swapping these out, I thought it'd be a good time to just talk about the 1903 Mark One and its corresponding automatic pistol model of 1918 Mark One, aka the Pedersen device. So let's dive in first with the standard 03. So let's just have these on the table. And then one that's new to me, certainly not new, new, and the one that was rebuilt in World War II, but still has all the original 03 features like the machined barrel bands and the uh, smooth butt plate, all that good stuff. In fact, it doesn't even have the hatcher hole drilled on the side. Just kind of notice that. And it even has a uh, lightning cut barrel. Later ones in the war did not. So if it was a rebuild, the later, yeah, earlier one. The biggest difference you'll notice, the finger grooves, the fuller grooves, are not. Uh, World War II and, and immediately right before World War II stocks didn't have them. That's actually common. You see that a lot with Millsurp. For some reason, these grooves get deleted before World War II in several nations. Anyway, as we know, the uh, Craig Jorgensen, the 3040 Craig, the model 19, excuse me, the 1896 and 98 was the U.S. first smokeless powder rifle for the Army. For the Navy, it was actually the 1895 Winchester, also known as the Lee Navy. Well, both had some issues, like a lot of first generation smokeless, and after the uh, Spanish War, America got introduced to the 1893 Mauser, and then of course, as early as 1900, a prototype at Springfield Armory was built on the Mauser action. We're not going to go into the whole legal thing. It wasn't quite as messy as you might think, actually quite civil, because it all took place before World War I. But by 1903, we had the initial version firing the 30 aught 3 cartridge for 1903. It was considered more powerful than 3040 Craig, officially 30 U.S. Army, but it was still a round nose bullet. So they were getting ready for production. In fact, they built a good number at Springfield in 1904. 1905, it was fully adopted, but then they would have to go back and change things because we had the new Spitzer round, 30-06, that we know and love today. This actually required that the sides be changed not once, but twice. The initial prototypes versus the full 1905 version, and then the version for Spitzer. Also, quite famously, the bayonet was changed from a spiker to a uh, blade bayonet. And there are lots of other changes besides. For example, early stocks did not have any reinforcing bolts. Then we'd get one early on, and we actually wouldn't get the second bolt until 1917, so, you know, World War II era. Excuse me, World War One era, Great War. Now the original guns would all have a blued finish. And the uh, wood furniture was made out of black walnut. As far as I know, even into World War II, the furniture is still made out of black walnut. You had the uh, P-proof on the wrist here. And America was ahead of the curve, not just in going with the Mauser action and internal five-round mag, charging by stripper clips, but they were doing the short rifle thing, which was a pretty new concept. 24-inch barrel, 44 inches overall, giving it a weight of about eight pounds and three quarters. Of course, being America, Accuracy was considered so important, so we have very finely adjustable sights now, windage and elevation. We have a hooded front with this clamp on that's often missing on these stacking swivels. Yeah, we get the deal. These were put into production at not only Springfield, but also Rock Island, at least for a time. Although production was slowed down in 1913, and actually stopped at Rock Island entirely because of budget reasons and so on and so forth. Of course, it was started back up for the Great War, and production, while it never ended at Springfield, was ramped up considerably. If you were wondering, America had fewer than 850,000 
1903s prior to the war, which was enough to equip the armed forces at the time. But it wasn't enough for the war, which is why we ended up with the uh, infield, or the U.S. infield model of 1917, from uh, Remington, Winchester, and, and Eddystone, which is a secondary Remington facility, which uh, made things quite creative. So we actually had two service rifles because there weren't enough of these. And we've done comparison videos long ago on the, the 1903 versus the 1917. So that's pretty well standard, and by the war, things are standardized. There's a few simplifications, uh, like a rib trigger goes to smooth, some patterning on other parts is uh, minimized. But no, it's a pretty well standard gun, still a high degree of fit and finish. Of course, being a U.S. Marshall gun, the only serial number is on the receiver. Although sometimes you'll find the O3 with the serial scribed on the bolt. Some people say that was done by the Marine Corps. Others say it was a target thing because the bolt matched the um, receiver so well and had good results. But the fact is that the U.S. was really ahead of the curve when it came to interoperability of parts. I mean, that's the whole reason that parts were serialized. Not because it's pretty and looks cool, but because, you know, parts weren't always compatible in other nations. So they needed to make sure the right parts stayed together so the guns worked right. So, you know, pretty standard gun here. We have a cock on open system. Oops. See there? With a turn down bolt. Like I said, five round mag. Last round hold back. Well, un unless this switch is flipped here which is your cutoff, kind of an old style device. When in this position, up, you can feed until your magazine's empty, then it holds back to let you know no more. Like so, you can run the bolt to your heart's content. That's because it doesn't actually feed from the magazine, it's held in reserve, you know the deal. You can single shot it until needed. Definitely an old style thing. Definitely a leftover for the Craig. And even this caulking piece is very Craig-esque. No cleaning rod under the barrel. But we have a storage compartment in the stock for a cleaning kit. Straight stock. Full upper handguard. And a blade bayonet. And typically a leather sling. So that was what was produced. Now, of course, Rock Island and Springfield would stop production briefly because of the whole heat treat thing, going from the old case hardened to the newer methods. That's a story for another video, but, you know, around serial number 800,000 at Springfield, around serial number 285,000 at Rock Island, and they were back up and, uh, back up and running. So, yeah, just how it goes. But luckily, the infield was available to kind of fill in the thing. I've made my opinion on that kind of clear over the years. It's not really an issue. I think it was considered to be a bigger problem than it really was. In fact, fewer than 100 have exploded over the years. Fewer than uh, 60 back in the day. A lot of those in lab testing. Even though the U.S. infield was more common, this was the standard. Americans really liked its accuracy. It was also lighter. And of course it had the made here thing going on. So, what about the Mark I? Very interesting story. You probably know it, but hey, we're just hanging out, so let's talk about again. If you're thinking the standard 1903 on top and the 1903 Mark I on the bottom pretty much look the same, that's the point. The whole point was essentially a standard rifle could use the new device now its creator john Pedersen, worked for remington on and off he was um you know contemporary of browning and quite a quite a good inventor maybe not browning's level but still very good and he actually made the uh, model 10 shotgun which saw some use in world war one he would also later make a serious competitor to the uh, M1 Grand, as well as a new cartridge, but that's kind of getting ahead. But so yeah, he worked for Remington and was sometimes a freelancer. And right after, I mean, people knew the war was coming. 
After it was declared in 1917, he started tinkering with the new device, which he called the automatic bolt. So in the summer of that year, he asked the uh, U.S. Ordnance Department for a meeting. He wanted to show them something special, kind of Christmas comes early. And uh, he was granted this demonstration, scheduled for October 8th, 1917. Uh, basically, it would be the, the head of the Ordnance Department, uh, General Crozier, but also some other people that needed to see it, and some uh, senators. Yeah, this was back in a time when senators could keep a secret because this whole thing was hush-hush. He didn't, didn't tell them what they were coming to see. And even after that, it was classified as top secret. Yeah, that's also been in the U.S. knew how to keep top secret documents uh, where they needed to be. But, um, yeah. Neat concept. Oh, and by the way, they were meeting at a rifle range right outside of Washington, D.C. So that's back when you could actually have guns there. So they meet up, and even at the even at the meeting, he doesn't really tell them what's going on. First, he pulls out a standard-looking 1903, and then he um, shoots a couple of rounds at 30 out six, pretty standard. But then he pops the bolt out. This is very difficult to do. Let's set you down. It'd be a lot easier. Sorry, guys. Always do that. Always put it in. A, you need to put it in the middle position. For that selector in there pull your bolt out and that's where the magic of his automatic bolt comes into play and the hole so basically you would use the same device the bolt latch to lock in his device now of course i don't have one very few exist in the world today under 100 maybe not more than 30 or 40. I've said it for years, I don't know why someone doesn't do a dummy version. Make it out of metal or even polymer or just, you know, rubber, whatever. Just to be stuck into one of these guns for fun. Either way, he pulls it out and, uh, well, it makes it into a semi-automatic rifle. As you would imagine. And they were duly impressed and it would quickly be sent over to General Pershing in November of that same year. And just two months after the initial demo, he would have one in France with his general staff and a few others, powers that be. That would be on December 9th. And already by the 11th, he sent a telegram back to the USA saying, we need to buy 100,000 of these to start with, as well as 5,000 rounds of ammo per device, plus additional ammo if we're going to take it into combat, and extra mags, yada yada yada. And just to make sure he drove the point home, he sent a second telegram, which immediately led to the automatic bolt adoption as the, well, automatic pistol, 30 caliber, model of 1918. Why that weird name? Because the cartridge is maybe a bit of a pistol caliber cartridge, but also to hide the true intention, because this is still very top secret, very hush hush. This was to be the weapon that would win the war for the US. Keep in mind, this is after trench warfare had been going on for years. It was a stalemate. And everyone was trying to think of new inventions everywhere you know tanks airplanes but also small arms germany of course had the mp18 submachine gun italy had the villa perosa and later the beretta 18 submachine gun russia even had the 1916 fedorov and uh, france had the rsc 1917 automatic rifle and this was to be america's thing again i really wish i had something to show you if I could, I'd put up pictures, but you can, you can Google it. But the uh, device became colloquially known as the Pedersen device. Essentially, it would slide in place, like I said, and lock in. Then sticking out the side at an angle would be a 40-round magazine. And then it would have a bit of a kind of starter barrel to get into the regular barrel. And it would eject cartridges out the side. That's the ejection port. 
and the trigger would work with the device and its sear disconnector to every time you pull the trigger one shot so the cartridge itself is quite interesting 30-18 3018 for the year 1919 yeah they're still doing that uh, this system won't last for much longer 30-3 30-6 30 3018 it was roughly an 80 grain projectile and um, out of this barrel it was around 1300 FPS so you can do the math you can do the comparisons essentially it was a 7.65 by 20 cartridge which uh, well, actually will appear later in a modified form in France. So, more than a pistol round, but of course less than 30-06, but we're getting 40 rounds rapid fire. Now, when uh, General Pershing tried it out, they were looking for accuracy, ability to penetrate a target at distance. They were looking for how quick you could actually use it in practical terms, fire it. And they were looking at durability, dependability, reliability. And I suppose it, it did well enough. Now, it was just a pretty much straight blowback system. Again, the cartridge is, was weak enough. It didn't really need to do any more. And so, yeah, re leading into 1918, you get into March in Remington. We get a contract to produce the device. Later, the magazines. And in May, they would get a contractor to produce the ammunition. And other entities would get other things. There'd be subcontractors. And of course, Springfield itself was instructed to modify the design of the 1903 to work with the new device. Unfortunately, it wasn't a drop-in device, but close enough, really. To lock in the device... The lever here was modified. Notice the cutout, as well as the arm it's on, the spindle, I believe it's called. As compared to standard one here. Also, of course, the trigger and sear had to be modified. Essentially an extra notch to catch the device. And of course the wall of the receiver had the cutout as an ejection port. And finally the stock had a small dip just to give adequate clearance there. So really not major changes and yes you could take a standard O3 and make those. You know, replace the trigger, replace the catch parts, modify your receiver, and cut down your stock just a bit. So yeah, not bad at all, all things considered. And it was known as the Mark I, both the rifle and the device. Because after the first contract, there were plans to make one and do this for the 1917 infield. Remember, they didn't know the war would be over that year. They wanted this en masse... For a big offensive they were planning for the spring of 1919 they had determined it was actually useful for both offense and defense when it comes to trench warfare and this was around the same time the 1918 bar browning automatic rifle was also dear that was another one of those uh, special weapons of the day so pretty nice and the initial contract was for a hundred thousand Pedersen devices like 800 million rounds of ammunition and uh, a large quantity of magazines. They wanted upwards of 30 or 40 per device. Plus, you needed other support equipment. You know, when you had this bolt pulled out of your gun, you can't lose it. So a special canvas pouch that attached to your web gear was made. The device itself, when it wasn't being used because it was much larger, was kind of kept in a, a pressed steel scabbard. And the magazines, being 40 rounds, they had a five-cell pouch. Now, you you know, at least one pouch per, per infantryman, but the web gear could support two easily, and even three if a guy really wanted to go gung-ho, but that's going to get a little weighty, all things considered. Because he's still supposed to carry his 30-06 ammunition and stripper clips and 
all that good fun stuff. So the primary contractor, Remington, of course Springfield for the guns, and then the subcontractors for the magazines and canvas goods are selected before the summer of 1918, and they began ramping up Remington for their parts, is trying out the Mark II for the 1917 at this point, and uh, plans are to, you know, have these en masse, but they're also trying to keep these very, very hush-hush. And the first uh, kind of rifles and, and devices are rolling off the production route line at the tail end of the summer of that year, into October. And they're just starting to have them en masse when November 11th, 1918 happens. And the war ends. Aside from the test ones sent over for Pershing and maybe a couple of others, these were never delivered, the Pedersen devices that is before the end of the war. So, now what? When it comes to the Patterson device story, the first thing that happened right after the war was over was the Mark II was canceled for the 1917. In fact, there would be a short debate over which would be the standard service rifle, the 1903 or the 1917. It was always going to be the 1903, frankly. You know, the 1917 has a lot to recommend it, and they weren't poo-pooing it yes yeah, so the 1917 itself was out at least you know officially it's becoming the standard and of course we have plenty the next step on march 1st 1919 the contracts were canceled or at least suspended so less than a year after the first one had been issued which was march 26 1918 but by that point the process was well underway again they put a lot of priority into this because they thought they would need it by that time, by the big offensive. By that point, Springfield had already turned out over 101,000 of the modified rifles. Uh, Rock Island never made them. And uh, Remington had built roughly 65,000 of the devices. And they had built about 1.6 million magazines. And ammunition, uh, several million rounds had been built made constructed whatever plus the pouches scabbards other accoutrement so they suspended it and then they looked at all the stuff they had and said it's, it's brand new still top secret by the way what do we do with it well a, a committee a board would be established because of course it would <laughs> and uh, they would try to do some studies. First, because they were already on the way to France, they would do some studies in theater there. Later, especially as 1920 rolls around, you'll see some uh, studies done, competitions done, and testing done in America at various forts and installations. They would even send a small number down to the Panama Canal to try it out in the tropical environment. And... In general, what was their uh, what was their conclusion? I will say it doesn't seem like reliability was a big issue. I haven't really read any sources that claim that they, that they were Germomatics. However, they did point out that the cartridge was pretty low power, all things considered. Was it more powerful than a lot of pistol rounds like the thirty eight at the time? Sure, but you know it's still not even thirty U.S. carbine at this point. They also concluded that the switching of bolts, trying to swap them out, it was you know, converting in the field may sound good in theory, but in practice, no, not really. We see this today with a lot of modern guns. You might convert before a mission, but in the end, it almost is easier to have two different guns than to try to convert one around. And kind of related to that, you're giving a lot of weight to an infantryman. The device itself weighed one kilogram, 2.2 pounds, plus the scabbard. Each loaded mag weighed one pound, and if they're at least carrying five plus the pouch, you're over five pounds there. Most would carry two pouches, so 10 pounds. So realistically, you're looking at roughly, you know, 12 to 15 pounds, including all the accoutrement, equipment, tools, cleaning gear for this. In addition to your regular 30 6 and stripper clips for it, and of course your bolt for your gun. And this just doesn't seem to be worthwhile. At least that's what the board concluded by 1920. The last 
modified 1903s that come out of Springfield in 1920, just because of the, you know, in, in the, it's, it's the standard. Rock Island was being shut down. There's actually an interesting transitional period where you'll see uh, some Rock Island receivers that were put together by Springfield in the 1920s and early 30s that are pretty cool. And that was it. They basically ordered all the Pedersen devices in the field to be brought back to Springfield. They were brought back in. Everything was collected up. And was essentially just put into storage because they didn't know what to do with it. And that's kind of where things would remain for a decade. And that's where my old rifle here steps back into the story. Around 1928, the 1903A1 was... Uh, first created and that had this full stock here on the wrist this what we would think of today as a semi pistol grip but really back then it was just a pistol grip stock very well respected for target shooting along with these sights and this was supposed to be the new standard although it never really came to it in total fruition the uh, the A2 was essentially a uh, training device a targeting device Subcaliber, as they sometimes are called. And really, during this period, nothing's happening until 1931 rolls around. Then they decide, okay, look, the, the Pedersen devices, all their stuff, it, it's surplus to needs. This is during the time of prohibition. This is during the time that the National Firearms Act is about to be passed. So they're worried about criminals getting automatic weapons, military stuff, blah, blah, blah. They don't need them, they're just taking up space. So, they're ordered to have a giant bonfire. Actually, multiples. Multiple locations were ordered to destroy the Pedersen device, the magazines, and to destroy the ammunition, and even destroy a lot of the, the gear. Uh, although it seems like some of the canvas gear was spared and just sold off or given away. But uh, the mags, the ammo, the devices, they were not spared, and they took it quite seriously. That's why, even though 65,000 were made, fewer than 100 exist today. They were very, very thorough and serious about it. Yeah, that's one way to get rid of something, I suppose. Uh, some were rescued by slipping into lunch boxes, as it said, or kind of pulled out of the fire when they were just, just kind of, yeah. And some were donated to museums and, and libraries, but... Yeah, and what's really funny, even now, it's not publicly known. It's still considered a secret device. It's just more of a bureaucratic holdover. But, yeah. So what about the rifles? Well, luckily for them, they're fine. They're late production, good heat treat, receiver guns, U.S. needs guns. So in 1937, right after the adoption of the M1 Garand, there was a repair, repair refurbishment program for the older O3s and what have you. And so, that's where this comes in. They were basically just converted back to standard O3. The trigger, the sear, the uh, bolt. Mag cut off. Were all ordered just to be taken back to standard. Even the stocks. Like this one you can tell here doesn't have the small cutout below the port. Like this one. Even though you can tell it basically clears it. And this was put in the C stock, the A1, because that was the standard. Not all of them were, but some of them were. So that was the fate of most uh, 1903 Mark Ones, was to just basically be put back to standard with a few weirdities. That's a word I'm using, weirdities. Like this cutout here and the old school marking on the receiver. And I've read that many of these ended up in National Guard hands, but I've also seen others that ended up across the place because obviously war wasn't far off. It started in Europe in 1939 and would come to America at the end of 1941, which is where the 1903 kind of comes from. Remington started off using the old Rock Island tooling, making 1903s, although they would not have the grooves in the stock. And a few other small simplifications. But they would soon switch over to the O3A3. This first appeared in May of 1942, and uh, they actually shipped both the A3 and the 1903 modified 
for a time, but by 1943, yeah, it was it was all 03 A3s. The big real difference that's important is the rear sight being the tangent style, the aperture style, excuse me, the peep style versus the tangent, and being further back. This actually is a better sighting system, and it's more in line with the M1 Grand, which was officially the standard. Of course, they also had several simplifications, like more stamped parts, which is why on this rebuild you see this barrel band here, late style. And the modifieds can have a kind of an interesting mix of parts. And Smith Corona would actually join in the same time, 1942, building them. Because Springfield, Winchester, they were built busy with other projects, so on and so forth. And the, uh, the Mark Ones would continue to soldier on through the Second World War. And they just, you know, with 101,000 built, they pop up in random areas here and there. And they were a good rifle to serve until there were enough M1 Grands to go around, basically. And by the time of Korea, you're basically just seeing the O3 A4 snipers. And after Korea, they're essentially out of service, except for some weird pockets here and there. Of course, National Guard, Target trainings, the... Uh, DCM and later CMP would be selling them off. Good times, fun stuff. So, that's that's pretty much it for the Patterson device, quite frankly. So let's talk about my reasons for upgrading rifles here. If it's not obvious, but hey, we're just hanging, right? Obviously, this one's in better shape. Yeah, there are some kind of hairline cracks in the stock in a few areas. But this is an original World War I stock. It has the grooves. It even has the correct style of upper handguard. Those handguards would actually change right after World War I. But even though this one has a been there, done that look, I always liked that it was in the A1 type stock. It didn't offend me, especially considering it had clear signs of being change for the war actually like the lathe marks on the barrel pretty pretty neat honestly world war ii barrels are fine but they're known for being a little more rushed however it's difficult to say this one is an vast improvement clear and that goes to the internals as well this one my old one has the rebuild parts so not the Pedersen specific. That's correct for it. It'd be weird if it had the originals. This one, though, seems to have the correct parts. The uh, bolt release slash uh, magazine cutoff and its spindle are correct. The trigger and sear seem to be correct inside, best I can tell. Not an expert, but best I can tell. It has the cutout on the stock and the fuller grooves, which is why I don't mind if the stock's a little cracked because it's original including the handguard, so, you know, it is what it is. And it has the original period correct dated barrel as well. Both will be phosphated. In fact, they quit bluing 1903s during World War I. Although, sometimes you'll still see, like, small parts blued, like barrel bands and stuff, even in World War II. Just, you know, whichever subcontractor had them. Maybe in a perfect world, I'd keep both, but that's not how I'd do. If I'm going to get something like this, this needs to go. I don't need two Mark 1s. And it would be strange to keep these two and not keep this one. For some reason, even though this gun too is a rebuild, it speaks to me. I don't know why. It just I just like it. And even though there's not a big difference between a standard 03 and an 03 Mark 1, I, I feel like you need both if you're doing a collection. Now, I wouldn't mind picking up one day a 1903 modified. That'd be cool. But, yeah, that's just how I, I, I do my collections. I'd, I'd rather have a nicer gun than one of everything. And it's time to upgrade. This also keeps expenses at bay, you know, reasonable. If you try to keep everything, the, the cost just goes crazy. And... When my friend was going to bring this over to sell, I was just going to post it for him to sell, but once I saw it, I just kind of felt drawn to it. So, end of the gun collection, it will go. 
because it is a neat little piece, a side note in history. And this one will go up and hopefully make someone else a good example piece or a good shooter grade, 1903, because it could be either of those. And maybe one day they'll pass it along as they find a nicer one. There's that secondary hole drilled there. And that is not there on this one. Strangely, it's not there on this one either. It just has the original small hole on the side, but yeah. Yeah, this one does seem to be pretty darn correct. As far as the influence on history, well, like I said, Pedersen would go on to make a competitor to the M1 Grand. It would lose out, but it gave serious competition and definitely forced the Grand system itself to be improved over time. You know, competition's good. And probably directly led to the whole 30 caliber carbine project. And of course in France, we had their new cartridge. Notice the uh, port on this is about the same ejection port size on this uh, 1935. It's not the same cartridge, but the 7.65 long from France is uh, definitely directly inspired by the Patterson round. Basically a souped up 32 Browning. And of course that was used in their uh, 1938 submachine gun as well. I don't know. I do like interesting parts of history and kind of showing what did and didn't work. And that's why I do like the, the Mark I. And again, growing up, I shot one of these uh, friends. Not not the same one, but, you know, I learned about the whole Patterson story quite early on. And really, it didn't become public knowledge until a lot of the guns started being sold off post-World War II. It wasn't so much top secret at that point. It was just a footnote, an experimental thing from World War I that never took off, frankly. But, um, yeah, it definitely kind of foretold the coming of the automatic rifle, the submachine gun, and just the switch from bolt action. And, of course, the 1903, 1903A3 would be the U.S.'s last standard-issue bolt action gun. And the U.S. would be early on in adopting the Grand, and um, maybe the early trials with the Pedersen helped propel that during the 20s and 30s. I don't know. But, no, I just... Uh, over the years, try to improve my collection, get a nicer gun here, a nicer gun there. And I'm not afraid to pick up an example piece for the interim. And I would encourage you not to either, unless it's just complete dog. The one caveat I would say, don't buy a rifle that's been severely sporterized thinking you're going to restore it. With the cost of original parts now, it already becomes not really financially wise. Even if you do, you know it's a pieced together gun. And oftentimes it won't be correct. It, yeah, you know what I mean? The pieces usually don't come from the same place in time. That's what I would say it's not worth it. But if it's just a gun that has honest wear and tear, or has just been uh, rebuilt, yeah, don't run away from that. Or if it's a non-matching gun, if it's a country that does serial numbers, don't be afraid to buy a non-matching gun. If the price is right, of course. And then if you find a matching one later, upgrade. This is my opinion, but, you know, we're just talking CNR, Millsurp, because it's really, it's really my first love when it comes to guns. I love history, I love the old mechanics, and what's great about these is it's old wood and steel. I mean, these things have stood the test of time, and that's neat. Modern guns are cool, too. We had plenty on the channel, but once in a while, I just gotta go old school and talk old school with you. And what's great about the O3, you can still get 30 out 6 ammo. So, yeah, you can still shoot them, unlike some other old bolt actions. Anyway, if you're in the 1903s, let's talk about them in the comments. Let me know what you think of this one. Do yeah. you have any interesting examples? I know some of the marine ones are pretty cool. And uh, I don't have a Smith Corona. Maybe one day I'll pick one up. I've had them in the store before, just never kept one. They're neat in their own right, too. And there's a whole story there with the A3. I just kind of skimmed through it. But there's a whole thing with the different barrels and, and uh, grooves and all that for sure. But, yeah. 
If you could, as always, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, check out the link to Patreon. With that, this is Misha, and I'll be back with a more modern, less boring topic next time. Thanks, guys.